Uterine Fibroids Introduction Fibroid is the commonest benign tumor of the uterus, and also the commonest benign solid tumor in females. These are more common in nulliparous or those having one child in fertility. The prevalence is highest between 35 to 45 years. Histologically, this tumor is composed of smooth muscle and fibrous connective tissue, so named uterine lyomyoma, myoma, or fibromyoma. Etiology Etiology still remains unclear. The following theories are implicated. Chromosomal abnormality in about 40% of cases, there is a varying type of chromosomal abnormality, particularly chromosome 6 or 7, rearrangements, deletions. Somatic mutations in myometrial cells may also be the cause of uncontrolled cell proliferation. Role of polypeptide growth factors Epidermal growth factor, insulin-like growth factor 1, transforming growth factor, stimulate the growth of lyomyoma either directly or via estrogen. A positive family history is often present. Risk factors, nulliparity, obesity, hyperestrogenic state, black women, protective factors, multiparity, smoking. Types, Uterine fibroids are classified by anatomic location into body or corporeal, which further encompasses interstitial, making up 75%, and predominantly intramural, subserous, constituting 15%, submucosal, representing 5%, and cervical, which includes anterior, posterior, central, and lateral locations. Within the subserous category, we find subserous broad ligament or pseudo and wandering or parasitic fibroids, while submucous fibroids are further classified as sessile and pedunculated or polyp. The fibroid subclassification system is as follows. Submucosal, zero, pedunculated intracavity, one, less than 50% intramural. Intramural, two, greater than or equal to 50% intramural. 3. Contacts endometrium, 100% intramural. 4. Intramural. 5. Subserosal, greater than or equal to 50% intramural. Subserosal. 6. Subserosal, less than 50% intramural. 7. Subserosal pedunculated. 8. Other. Specify, for example, cervical, parasitic. Secondary changes in fibroids include degenerations, atrophy, necrosis, infection, vascular changes, and sarcomatous change. Degenerations Hyaline degeneration It's the most common type of degeneration affecting all sizes of fibroids, affecting 65% of fibroids. Cystic degeneration typically occurs following menopause and is common in interstitial fibroids, results from liquefaction of the areas with hyaline changes. Calcific degeneration, affecting approximately 10%, usually involves the subserous fibroids with small pedicle or myomas in postmenopausal women. Red degeneration. It's also known as corneous degeneration, which tends to occur in large fibroid particularly during the second half of pregnancy and purpurium. Symptoms of red degeneration may include pain in the abdomen and fever. Treatment involves symptomatic treatment with the use of analgesics and antipyretics for pain relief. Atrophy Atrophic manifests as changes occurring following menopause due to diminished estrogen support, resulting in a reduction in the size of the fibroid. Necrosis arises from circulatory inadequacy, leading to central necrosis of the tumor. Infection. In the case of infection, the pathogenic invasion gains access to the tumor core through the thinned and sloughed surface epithelium of the submucous fibroid. Vascular changes. Vascular changes introduce variations like dilatation of the vessels, telangiectasis, or dilatation of the lymphatic channels, lymphangiectasis, within the myoma.
The specific cause of these changes remains unknown. Sarcomatous changes. Sarcomatous changes, although rare, may occur in less than 0.1% of cases. The usual type is leiomyosarcoma. Clinical features. The majority of fibroids remain asymptomatic, 75%. The symptoms are related to the anatomic type and size of the tumor. The site is more important than the size. Menstrual abnormalities. Heavy menstrual bleeding, in 30% of cases, is a classic symptom of symptomatic fibroid. The menstrual loss is progressively increased with successive cycles. It is conspicuous in submucous or interstitial fibroids. The causes are increased surface area of the endometrium, normal is about 15 square centimeters, interference with normal uterine contractility due to interposition of fibroid, congestion and dilatation of the subjacent endometrial venous plexus caused by the obstruction of the tumor, endometrial hyperplasia due to hyperestrogenism. Irregular bleeding may be due to ulceration of submucous fibroid or fibroid polyp, torn vessels from the sloughing base of a polyp, associated endometrial carcinoma. Dysmenorrhea. The congestive variety may be due to associated pelvic congestion or endometriosis. Spasmodic type is associated with extrusion of polyp and its expulsion from the uterine cavity. Infertility. Infertility, in 30% of cases, may be a major complaint. The probable known attributing factors are uterine distortion and elongation of the uterine cavity makes sperm ascent difficult. Preventing rhythmic uterine contraction due to fibroids during intercourse obstructs sperm transport. Congestion and dilatation of the endometrial venous plexus impede nidation. Atrophy and ulceration of the endometrium over the submucous fibroids block nidation. Menorrhagia and dyspareunia. Tubal, corneal block, due to position of the fibroid. Marked elongation of the tube over a big fibroid. Associated salpingitis with tubal block. Pain in the lower abdomen. The fibroids are usually painless. Pain may be due to some complications of the tumor or due to associated pelvic pathology. Pain can also be due to degeneration or torsion of a subserous pedunculated fibroid. Pain can also be caused by extrusion of polyp. Abdominal swellings. Noticed as lump. The patient may have a sense of heaviness in the lower abdomen. Pressure symptoms. Anterior cervical fibroid causes increased frequency of micturition. Posterior cervical fibroid causes constipation, acute retention of urine. Central cervical fibroid causes acute retention of urine, and it's called the Lantern of Dome of St. Paul Cathedral. Signs General examination reveals varying degrees of pallor, depending upon the magnitude and duration of menstrual loss. Abdominal examination The tumor may not be sufficiently enlarged to be felt per abdomen, but if enlarged to 14 weeks or more, the following features are noted. Palpation feel is firm, more toward hard. May be cystic and cystic degeneration. Margins are well-defined, except for the lower pole, which cannot be reached, suggestive of pelvic in origin. Surface is nodular, may be uniformly enlarged in a single fibroid. Mobility is restricted from above downwards, but can be moved from side to side. Pelvic examination. By manual examination reveals a uterus irregularly enlarged by the swelling felt per abdomen. That the swelling is uterine is evidenced by the uterus is not felt separated from the swelling, and as such, a groove is not felt between the uterus and the mass. The cervix moves with the movement of the tumor felt per abdomen. Investigation. To confirm the diagnosis, Ultrasound and color Doppler findings are homogeneous hypoechoic mass and peripheral vascularity. MRI is more accurate compared to ultrasound. Preoperative assessment. Apart from routine preoperative investigations, intravenous pyelography to note the anatomic changes of the ureter may be helpful. Management of fibroid uterus. In symptomatic fibroids, before drug therapy, one must be certain about the diagnosis. 
The objectives of medical treatment are to improve menorrhagia and to correct anemia before surgery, to minimize the size and vascularity of the tumor to facilitate surgery, in selected cases of infertility to facilitate hysteroscopic or laparoscopic surgery, as an alternative to surgery in perimenopausal women or women with high risk factors for surgery, where postponement of surgery is planned temporarily. Drugs used to minimize blood loss. Antiprogesterones, mifepristone, danazol, gonadotropin-releasing hormone analogs, agonist, antagonist, levonogestrel-releasing intrauterine system prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors, mifepristone. Mifepristone, Russell Uclaf 486, is very effective in reducing fibroid size and also menorrhagia. It may produce amenorrhea. It reduces the side of the fibroid significantly. A daily dose of 25 to 30 milligrams is recommended for three months. A 5 milligrams daily dose is also found effective. Long-term therapy is avoided as it causes endometrial hyperplasia. Asoprisnil is used with success. It's a selective progesterone receptor modulator. It does not cause endometrial hyperplasia. Danazol. It can reduce the volume of a fibroid slightly. Because of androgenic side effects, danazol is used only for a period of three to six months. Danazol administered daily in divided doses, ranging from 200 to 400 milligrams for three months, minimizes blood loss or even produces amenorrhea by its anti-gonadotropin and androgen agonist actions. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist. Drugs commonly used are gasarelin, Luperelin, Bucerelin, or Naferelin. Mechanism of action is sustained pituitary downregulation and suppression of ovarian function. Optimal duration of therapy is three months. Add-back therapy may be needed to combat hypoestrogenic symptoms. Advantages of gonadotropin-releasing hormone analogs. Improvement of menorrhagia and may produce amenorrhea. Improvement of anemia. Relief of pressure symptoms. Reduction in size in 50% of cases when used for a period of six months. Reduction in vascularity of the tumor. Reduction in blood loss during myomectomy. May facilitate laparoscopic or hysteroscopic surgery. Disadvantages. Hypoestrogenic side effects. Vasomotor symptoms. Trabecular bone loss. Cost is high. Regrowth of myomas on cessation of therapy. Degeneration, some leiomyomas, causing difficulty in myoma and nucleation. GnRH antagonist. Cetrorelix or Ganorelix causes immediate suppression of the pituitary and the ovaries. They do not have the initial stimulatory effect. Benefits are the same as those of agonist. Onset of amenorrhea is rapid. Surgical management of fibroid uterus. Myomectomy. Important considerations prior to myomectomy. It should be done mainly to preserve the reproductive function. The wish to preserve the menstrual function in Paris women should be judiciously complied with. Myomectomy is a riskier operation when the fibroids is too big and too many. Risk of recurrence and persistence of fibroid is about 35 to 50 percent. The risk of persistence of menorrhagia is about 1 to 5 percent. The risk of relaparotomy is about 20 to 25 percent. Pregnancy rate following myomectomy is about 40 to 60 percent. Pregnancy following myomectomy should have a mandatory hospital delivery, although the chance of scar rupture is rare, a little more when the cavity is open. Indications of myomectomy. Persistent uterine bleeding despite medical therapy. Excessive pain or pressure symptoms. Size greater than two weeks women desirous to have a baby, unexplained infertility with distortion of the uterine cavity, recurrent pregnancy wastage due to fibroid, rapidly growing myoma during follow-up, subserous pedunculated fibroid, prerequisite for myomectomy, hysteroscopy or hysterosalbingography to exclude any submucous fibroid or a polyp or any tubal block, hysteroscopy, or endometrial biopsy.
in cases of irregular cycles, not only to remove a polyp, but also to exclude endometrial carcinoma. Examination of the husband from a fertility point of view. Semen analysis. Contraindications of myomectomy. Infected fibroid. Growth of myoma after menopause. Suspected malignant change, sarcoma. Paris women where hysterectomy is safer and is a definitive treatment. Functionless fallopian tubes due to bilateral hydrosalpinx tubo ovarian mass. The decision must be judicious with the advent of microsurgery and antiretroviral therapy. Pelvic or endometrial tuberculosis during pregnancy or cesarean section. Embolotherapy. Uterine artery embolization causes a vascular necrosis followed by shrinkage of fibroid. Uterine arteries are occluded by injecting polyvinyl alcohol particles through percutaneous femoral catheterization. This may be an option for women with symptomatic fibroid where surgery is not preferred. Result. Improvement of menorrhagia is observed in 80 to 90% with 60% reduction in size. Complications of uterine artery embolization. Post-embolization syndrome comprises of fever, sepsis, myometrial infarction, and necrosis, amenorrhea, and ovarian failure. Complications related to the procedure is femoral artery injury. Contraindications. Active pelvic infection, desire for future pregnancy, drug allergy. Ultrasound. MRI-guided focused high-energy ultrasound waves induce coagulative necrosis in myomas. It causes localized thermal ablation of the fibroid tissue. It may need multiple treatments. Hysterectomy. Hysterectomy is the operation of choice in symptomatic fibroid when there is no valid reason for myomectomy. Patients over the age of 40 years and those not desirous of further childhood are the classic indications. A total hysterectomy is performed. However, a subtotal hysterectomy may have to be done in few condition. Image-based discussion. Here's a hysterectomy specimen showing multiple lyomyomas. Here is a bivalved hysterectomy specimen showing intramural and subserosal lyomyomas. Here is a gross intraoperative photograph of a degenerated uterine lyomyoma. This benign neoplasm can mimic an ovarian tumor. Here's a lyomyosarcoma. Gross appearance compared with lyomyoma. The small nodule on the left is well circumscribed with the bulging, white, firm, and world-cut surface typical of lyomyoma. The large, soft, hemorrhagic, and fleshy mass represents a lyomyosarcoma. Here's a gross image of hysteroscopic myomectomy wire loop technique. During the technique, the wire loop is placed at the most cephalad surface of the lyomyoma. The activated electrode is then passed through the tissue. Here, the picture depicts multiple lyomyoma shavings that were removed during a hysteroscopic myomectomy. Here's an image of hysteroscopic shelling out of the pseudocapsule surrounding a myoma. Here's an image of laparoscopic myomectomy, a transverse myometrial incision rather than a vertical incision allows more ergonomic laparoscopic suturing of the uterine defect. Here's a laparoscopic myomectomy showing removal of myomas. The myoma is grasped with the tenaculum. Traction and countertraction are used to separate the plane between the myometrium and myoma. Here's a laparoscopic myomectomy showing closure of uterine serosa. The uterine serosa is typically closed with a baseball stitch to decrease exposure of suture and adhesion formation. Here's an image of a laparoscopic myomectomy showing the placement of adhesion barrier. At the close of laparoscopic myomectomy, the pelvis and abdomen are irrigated, the fluid is suctioned, and measures to prevent adhesion formation may be applied. However, the safety and effectiveness of these barriers in laparoscopic surgery have not been established. Image A. Cellular lyomyomas show densely compacted cells forming fascicles. Image B. The cells have uniformly mild cytologic atypia. Hypercellular lyomyomas show even greater cell compaction, image C, with mild cytologic atypia, image D. 
Here is an ultrasound of a degenerated uterine leiomyoma that has the appearance of a complex mass. Here is a transvaginal image of a postmenopausal woman with calcified fibroids. The dense calcifications have shadowing behind them. The borders of the fibroids and uterus are not well seen due to the dense calcifications. Here is a transvaginal ultrasound image of the right adnexa showing a pedunculated fibroid. A solid appearing mass is noted in the right adnexa. No cystic areas are identified. The mass is slightly heterogeneous and has no appreciable posterior enhancement, but has some areas of shadowing. The mass is separate from the right ovary. The arrowhead demonstrates a thick stalk that connects the fibroid to the uterus. Here's a hysterosalpingogram showing multiple filling defects due to submucous myomas. Here's a hysterosalpingogram with an oblique view showing a submucous myoma that disappeared when more dye was injected. That's all for the video. We'll see you next time.